Hey film fans, every once in a while a film comes along and it doesn't matter when it was made or when it was set, but when you watch it, the combination of the story, the performances, the themes, the message, all work to knock you off your feet. Such is the case with this episode's film, which is also the final movie in my French Spring series. I'm talking about the 1988 film, Une Affaire de Femme, or Story of Women. And please join me as we consider what makes this film great. Hey film fans, I really love the community that is slowly building up around this page. I know that a page like this with long deep dive investigations of, let's just say, lesser known films is not an easy sell. And so I really appreciate those of you who come along, who comment, who share with your friends, who suggest movies for future videos and so on. It's a slow building community, but it's really important to me as I move forward with the channel. I just wanted to let you know that if you want to support the channel further, I'm now on Patreon and I'm adding new content over there as well, including every Friday where I put up a week in movies video and talk about movie business news, uh, film development, the culture of film in the US and elsewhere. Also, I just recently completed a 10 episode review of The Offer the new Paramount series by The Godfather. And if you wanna see more content like that, hop on over to Patreon and let me know what you'd like to see. It's only a euro a month, which is a little bit more than a dollar, but that's less than the price of a cup of coffee. That's less than a bus ticket across town. That's probably even less than the money you're spending on the power that you're using on your computer to watch this video right now, maybe not. I don't know how much people's electric bills cost, but you get the picture. So if you wanna support the channel more, if you wanna see it grow, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hop on over to Patreon and throw me a buck. Hey everybody, before we get into the film, don't forget to check out the poll and vote in the poll on my community page for what kind of series I should do next. Right now I'm considering Mumblecore, the films of John Sayles, and punk films, whatever that means. And right now, John Sayles and punk films are in a neck and neck tie. I'm gonna keep this running through the 4th of July weekend and whatever's ahead after the 4th of July is the subject I'll pick. So head on over and vote. Une Faire de Femme is a 1988 film that was directed by Claude Chabrol. It was co-written by Chabrol with Colo Tavernier and it features the, the cinematography of longtime Chabrol collaborator Jean Rabier, with production design by Francoise Benoit Fresco and music by Mathieu Chabrol. It features incredible performances by Isabelle Hubert, Francois Cluzet, who was also in Chocolat, released the same year, and two completely different performances two completely stellar performances, Niels Tavernier and Marie Trintignant. And before we get into the film, I just wanna say, the, the, something about the stars lined up for this or the stars got knocked out of whack, maybe, depending on your approach. When I set out to do the French Spring series, as I've mentioned elsewhere, particularly in the video on Le Boucher, I was spurred on by comments from a few of my uh, followers who suggested French films, and in particular, Chabrol films. And so I thought I would do a combination of films I'd seen before, um, Breathless, Lift to the Scaffold, Shoot the Piano Player, Cleo from Five to Seven, and films that I hadn't seen before, that, but had wanted to, like Le Samurai. Um, I always knew that I was going to do two Chabrol films because that had been the kind of impetus to get this whole thing off the ground. And when I was researching it, I, um, I hadn't seen a lot of Chabrol before. So I wanted to do one of his kind of classic era, late 60s, early 70s films, which was Le Boucher, The Butcher. 
And I wanted to do a later film by Chabrol from his kind of twilight era. And I didn't know a lot about that period of Chabrol, so I just did a little bit of research and I saw that he had made a few films with Hubert and she's one of the greatest living performers on earth right now, so why not do one of those? And Une Affaire de Femme kept coming up as one of the, the stronger films from that era. I didn't read a lot about it. I knew that it was a period piece, that it was set during the Second World War, and that it was about an independent woman or a woman striving for independence. That's all I really knew until I sat down the other day before I watched it to do a little research in preparation for my viewing and saw that it's loosely based on the true story of Marie-Louise Giraud, who was an abortionist in Nazi-occupied France during the Second World War. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm researching this film, you know, three days after the United States Supreme Court has effectively overturned Roe versus Wade. So there, there is a sense of, oh, do I want to go down this road right now? Well, it was on my list. It was the last film. And yeah, I want to go down the road right now. And join me as I talk about not only what makes this film great or fantastic, but the unsettling parallels with a film made in the late 80s, set in the early 40s, about the Nazis and French collaborators, the Vichy collaborators, and <laughs> sadly, 2022. There are going to be some spoilers in this video. Um, I'll continue to say that for a while. If you're new to the channel, when I talk about these films, I do engage in spoilers because I do do deep dives into them. So if you want to watch the film first or read up on Giraud's history, go ahead and do that and come back because I'm going to get into it now. So Une Affaire de Femme is a fictionalized version of Giraud's life. It's a wonderful film and for much of its runtime, it's almost a, cheerful would be the wrong word, but a, a buoyant, light-hearted film, if you can have a light-hearted film about an abortionist in Nazi-occupied France. And part of this is down to Hubert's performance, and all the performances are stunning in this film. In fact, oftentimes I talk a lot about uh, cinematography, editing, things like that, and there are some really wonderful um, stylistic flourish in this film. But what makes this film really great, what works about it most, are the script and the performances and the way the, the performers are directed. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about cinematography here, but I'm really going to focus most of this discussion on the story and the performances. So just quickly, what is the story? Huppert, who won the acting award at Venice for her performance in this role, she plays Marie, and as the film starts, Marie is living alone with her two children while her husband, Paul, is off fighting the war. And the film lets us know quite early on the, the sort of deprivation they're living in as we see them during the opening sequence out picking what I think are nettles. The boy says, <laughs> And then Marie says, They're going home to stew this up. And we, we see through the early stages of the film that they have no money. They can barely afford to eat. And they're, they're living in a time of war with, with the husband away and the wife barely able to make ends meet. Then... Almost inadvertently, Marie stumbles upon a neighbor who is giving herself a mustard bath. And the neighbor tells her, Ça fait la peau douce, la moutarde? Non. C'est pas pour ça. T'es enceinte? Bernard veut pas que je le garde. And the film doesn't really explain 
how Marie might know that that won't work. C'est pas comme ça que tu vas t'en débarrasser de ton môme. Parler de la moutarde. Or how Marie might know that something else might work. But soon we get Marie helping this woman to have an abortion. And the woman goes through a painful induced miscarriage. But then after that, she's incredibly grateful to Marie for having done this. And what we find out through the course of the film, although it's quite subtly done, is that a lot of the women who need Marie's services have husbands who are either away at war, are prisoners of war, or who are war dead. And they are or have engaged in relationships with German soldiers stationed in the town. The film doesn't go into a lot of detail about this, so we don't know if these women have chosen to be in those relationships, have been coerced into those relationships, or have been the victims of sexual assault. Probably knowing what we know about war, all three of those are possibilities. But after the success of that first procedure, Marie realizes that there is a clientele in the town whom she can help. And she sets about doing so. And she sets about charging money. And so through the word of mouth and the networks of gossip, she gets a steady clientele of women who are willing to pay for abortions. Not all of them are war widows. For example, she gets one woman, and this is a very important part in the film, who's already had several children. She says, basically, I've been pregnant for six years and she hates it. And she's, she's developed a hatred for her children and she's pregnant again and she doesn't want to have it. And so it's actually the husband who catches the wife attempting to induce an abortion herself who finds out about Marie's services and gets the wife to go to Marie. On m'a dit, il y a un autre moyen, Jasmine. So there are a lot of women during this situation who need this procedure and who need Marie's help. And that's what a lot of the film is about. And through the process of doing this, the deprivation that Marie lived through early on with her children starts to diminish a little bit. She starts to get a little bit of money. They have better food. She buys a pot of jam in a really nice scene. And, and as the kids just slather bread with jam and it's all over their faces, it's great. Um, they get slightly better accommodation, slightly better furnishings in their accommodation. They're not loaded. She's not rich, but they're not dirt poor any longer. And this goes on for about two years. And that's sort of the first hour, hour and 10 minutes of this hour and 40 minute film. During that time, Paul returns home. And a lot of what the film is about as well is Marie and Paul's strained relationship. And we are given to understand that that relationship may have been strained even before the war. But now Paul has come home. He's got post-traumatic stress syndrome, or as he calls it, shell shock. And there's, there's a lot in between them. And one of the things the film does really well and the script does really well is it doesn't explain it all to us. It just shows us that Marie for whatever her reasons are, is disdainful of Paul. Paul wants to be with her. He wants to be intimate with her. He's been at war. He wants to have sex. And she doesn't. She's not interested in him anymore. There's a sense that she developed independence while he was away. There's a sense that his shell shock has kind of changed him in some way. There's a sense that his inability to hold down a job is, has kind of diminished him in her eyes. And I'm gonna come back to this in a minute because it's an important part of the portrayal of Marie that part of why she doesn't like Paul or feels kind of repulsed by him physically is perhaps a flaw in her own personality. But much of the film's runtime is concerned with these kind of two parallel stories. Her slowly burgeoning success as a provider of abortions, illegal abortions, that's very important, and the way she keeps her relationship with Paul alive, but 
not physical. All of that changes in the final act of the film when Marie is arrested. And if you read anything about the real historical figure, one of the first things you'll see about her is that she was the last woman to be executed by guillotine in France. And that's where this movie is leading to as well. So we spend the last 20 or 30 minutes or so with Marie as she moves through the legal system and each avenue to freedom is closed off to her until the, the film ends with her execution. And so what we have here is a real kind of condemnation of Vichy France, of patriarchy, of political moralism, of the, the, the kind of ideology that would allow men to kill each other in war, but not allow women to help each other with abortions. And the film does a fantastic job of constructing Marie's reasons for doing it, some of which are not necessarily noble, but are driven by financial reasons. I guess they're noble if you think about the fact that she wants to give her children a better life. Combined with the societal sort of understanding of abortion. And the fact around abortion is that it has always existed. It will always exist. Abortion cannot be stopped. That is a fact. Regardless of what one's feelings, what one's kind of rational approach, what one's religion might say about the morality, the ethics, the legality of abortion, abortion will always exist. And there will always be people, almost always women, who will provide abortions, often at great risk to themselves, often at great risk to the women they're helping, because in an illegal setting, it's difficult to account for proper medicine, proper sterility, proper procedures, and so on. And so you have a society in which abortion is necessary, but wherein the, the figures in power have decided that it's a moral sin. And so this paradox is what the film examines. And it comes down quite clearly without being didactic, without being dogmatic, and without being preachy, on the side of Marie, the women who need abortions and the women who provide abortions. But it's how the film does that, as I said, through the script and through the performances that makes it work so well. So let's talk a little bit about that. First of all, there's Hubert's Marie. Isabelle Hubert is one of the greatest living actors on earth, as I've said. And by the time she made Une Affaire des Femmes, She'd been acting for over 15 years. She was well established in France, but also in the US. She'd been in Heaven's Gate, for example, and other English language films. So she brought that kind of international celebrity to this film, which she's making with kind of a giant of French cinema, Claude Chabrol. And she plays Marie wonderfully because she plays her humanly. And I don't mean humanly in a sort of like, oh, look at the humanity of Marie. She, she's so good. She's not. <laughs> she is not always good. She is a person trapped in a horrible situation, war, occupation. At the beginning of the film, she has a friend named Rachel who we see her having a night out with. And then Rachel goes missing and Marie's told, well, the Germans took her, you know, she's a Jew. And Marie's like, she's not a Jew, she's a Jew. I didn't even know she was a Jew. So Marie's in this situation where her best friend is just gone, never to be seen again. And Marie doesn't care.
that we're given to understand she doesn't care about this sort of thing. She's just a like average person. We find out through the course of the film that she can't read, she can't write. She's a peasant for want of a better word. She calls herself a hick, a hick from Normandy. Um, and she's flawed. And this is what I mean by the way she plays her with humanity. She is not always a good person. And we see this from very early on, and it's not necessarily that she's a bad person, but she's just not concerned about, for example, being nice or being good. She's concerned about trying to scrape together a life worth living. And that includes free time for herself away from her children, but it also includes trying to get a little bit of money and eventually it's going to include a, a level, a clear level or a clear layer of independence from her husband. We get a snippet of this early on when she's returning home from picking the nettles that I talked about and she runs into some neighbors and has this exchange. Oh, ce qu'elle est mignonne. Ah oui, si j'ai réussi quelque chose dans ma vie, c'est venir ce petit bout là. Later, when we get back to the flat, Pierrot, her son, is going to ask her. Et moi, quand j'étais née, t'étais contente aussi? Oh, bah dis donc. Mais toi, t'es un garçon. C'est déjà une réussite, ça, faire un garçon. Allez, viens laver la canard. And I love that response there. She, she sees probably that her son is looking for some specific affection, that he's looking maybe to be coddled. He's eight or nine years old. Of course he would be. But she doesn't give that to him. She just tells him, ah, you're a bore. Boys are always good. I have to explain to my daughter that she is good. And this, I think, is a moment that you wouldn't see in a film about motherhood today. It's not that she's bad or that she's cruel or abusive. She's just not going to play that game of um, buttering up everybody all the time, including her children. And through the course of the film, to be clear, we see that she loves Pierrot quite dearly and quite deeply. She's not ignoring him or abusive to him, but she's just not going to play this kind of game of, oh, you're beautiful too, sweetie. She's not going to play it with him. She's not going to play it with her clients. And she's not going to play it with her husband. Speaking of her husband, Paul's return at first would seem to threaten or complicate her early endeavors into providing abortions. Paul comes back after she's only done, I think, her first one, and he's trying to reestablish himself as the man of the house, but she resists him right away. And one of the strengths of the film, and I think one of its complicated aspects, is that she never really says why she resists him. There's one scene where he's coming on to her and she explains to him that it's not going to happen because... Tu sais ce que je frotte, là? Tu sais ce que je frotte? Tu crois que ça me donne envie? Tu sais bien que c'est pas de ma faute. C'est à cause du bruit des canons. Tu veux pas comprendre ce que c'était, non? La peur que ça vous fout dans le ventre. Et les autres? Quoi, les autres? Ils chiennent dans leur frog aussi, les autres? But she's already been cold to him before that, and she'll be cold to him throughout. She doesn't love him anymore. She recognizes him as the father of her children. She doesn't want to kick him out of the house. She wants him to work and bring money into the family, but she doesn't love him. She doesn't want to make love to him. And this leads her sometimes to be cruel to him. She calls him names. She makes fun of the fact that he shits himself, which probably is, you know, quite painful to him. And Clouzette plays Paul fantastically. It's a, it's a stunning performance. Hubert's performance gets a lot of the lip service for this film, rightly so, she's incredible. But Clouzette here is just fantastic and he's very different from in Chocolat. Because in Chocolat, as the, the sort of French diplomat who is in Cameroon. He is uh, the father of France who's away for a lot and you can watch that video here where I talk about it more. He's very self-assured. Um, 
He's very attractive to and attracted to his wife. And he's, he's, a, he's not cocky or super masculine, but he's just an assured presence. In Une Affaire de Femme, he's much more complex and much more nuanced in that he wants to be that person, but he's wounded, he's been a prisoner, he has in a way failed at war, whatever that means. Um, he comes home and he gets a job, but he loses his first job because they find him useless. His wife doesn't want him physically or sexually. And all through that, he's trying to maintain a semblance of dignity. He's trying to maintain a semblance of what somebody in the 1940s would have thought of as kind of fatherly or husbandly control over the household. His children love him. He spends time with them. He doesn't become abusive. He doesn't become angry. There are a couple of moments when he confronts Marie with what you might call violence, borderline vi violence. It's probably a really crappy thing to say, but he kind of just grabs her and says, now we're going to do it now. And she says no and walks off and that's it. For example, when he finds her on the street coming home one night. That's the extent of it. Um, and that's not good, but I think a lot of films would take a character like Paul and either have him go down a road of alcoholism, have him go down a road of sort of flagrant or blatant womanizing, or have him turn to abuse or attempted abuse to try to control the situation. But he doesn't. He, he struggles to sort of maintain what he sees as his dignity in the face of all of this um, until one key moment when he loses it. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So a lot of what makes this film work is that while it is an abortion film, while it is a film about occupation, it's also a film about two complex, wounded characters in a relationship where the love is gone. And it's examining this against the backdrop of these other scenarios. And this gives the film such complexity and such depth that you could almost watch the same film without the abortion storyline and you would still have a very good occupation film. And that's down to the script and that's down to their performances. Also great in the film is Marie Trintignant. I know I'm mangling that. Um, and she plays Lulu. And Lulu's an interesting character in the film. She is a prostitute. And Marie befriends her early in the film um, and is kind of fascinated by her. Marie gets a little bit of money from her abortion work and she goes to have her hair done. While she's at the hairdresser, she meets Lulu, they go for a stroll, they go for a drink, and she finds out that Lulu is a prostitute. And Lulu uh, works the docks, she works German soldiers, she feels bad about it and she charges them more, but she needs to do it in this town where most of the men are gone. Um, and she pays a little bit of money to local hotels and inns where she goes to, to have her encounters with her customers. And one of the sort of B stories in the film is that Marie begins to rent out a spare bedroom to Lulu so she can have her trysts there. She, Lulu pays less than she would at the hotel and Marie makes a little more money. And Trintignant's performance is great because she plays Lulu as kind of this cynical, blase woman who it has no shame at all about what she's doing, um, doesn't see any reason to feel shame. She understands that, you know, she needs to do what she needs to do to get by. And the film doesn't judge her in any way. Some of the characters in the film judge her. We'll get to that. But the film itself doesn't judge her. And this is a very interesting relationship because it's, it's implied, although never stated, that Lulu's prostitution and Lulu's lack of shame about her prostitution kind of spur Marie's confidence in providing abortions because she sees that 
Lulu is doing this thing that the community wants, or some of the community wants, um, one could argue, needs. And she's not going to feel any shame about it. And Marie develops that similar attitude towards her abortion services. And their friendship is really well played throughout, and the two actors perform great together. Lulu has a regular client named Lucien, who's played by Niels Tavernier, and he's a, a sort of young, confident man who explains later that he's used several kinds of loopholes and shenanigans to get out of having to go to war, which complicates him because this is, you know, the war you should be fighting. This is the resistance, you know. All of this stuff is going on and he has decided to kind of stay home and live the good life. And he falls for Marie and he and Marie have an affair. And this, of course, complicates Marie's relationship with her husband, Paul, because Paul knows it's going on or he suspects it's going on. And the interesting thing about the film, and, and one of the things I really love is that <laughs> Lucian is not a very good guy. He's attractive. He's got some money. He's very sort of male and patriarchal. In fact, in one scene when Marie gets held up with a kind of abortion related situation and she's late to one of their meetings, she shows up and this is how Lucian responds to her being late. <laughs> Il est 3 heures, non Chérie. Bah, c'est pas de ma faute. Si je te disais ce qui m'est arrivé. Je supporte pas qu'une femme soit en retard. He's kind of a prick. And Marie doesn't care. Even after he talks down to her like that, which is, I guess, mild talking down, but it's much worse than anything Paul says or does to her. She just keeps coming back and keeps having this affair and keeps going and gets more and more blasé about it to the point where she's actually inviting Lucien to the flat when Paul is supposed to be at work. And this is part of her, you know, the independence I mentioned that she's trying to develop between her and Paul, but it's also going to lead to her downfall um, in a very kind of sad and unfortunate way, which I'll come back to in just a minute. It's important to note that while Marie can sometimes be blasé about her life, about her affair, and sometimes about the services she's providing, the film is not. The film takes a very steely-eyed approach to abortion. It's not a kind of, oh, abortion is love and roses, abortion um, makes the world a better place. Hey, everybody, let's go have abortions. Um, it is an argument for legalized abortion. There's no doubt about that. But it takes a very sort of steely-eyed, as I've said, look at how abortion works in situations when it's illegal. And one of the most kind of devastating scenes in the film is when a woman arrives at Marie's flat with two children. And I've mentioned earlier that one of Marie's clients or patients is a woman who's already had several children. She says she's been pregnant for six years. She's starting to hate her children because she hates being pregnant. She hates nursing and then getting pregnant again and then nursing and so on. And so Marie provides her with a service and her sister-in-law shows up with two of her children and tells Marie this. Vous savez, quand son mari a vu qu'elle était morte, il n'a pas supporté. Il s'est jeté sous un train. This is a heartbreaking and complex scene because the woman is very religious as she explains to Marie. Les bébés dans le ventre de leur mère ont une âme. And Marie is affected by this. Marie is not unmoved. Marie doesn't say anything. Like, she has been blasé about a lot of her life, but she doesn't say anything blasé here. She feels the pain of this loss, 
but she also understands the practical realities of why the woman came to her and what she, Marie, did. So she mounts a defensive kind of response to this. She doesn't want to take the blame for these two deaths, but at the same time, she's aware of what was going on. C'est pas moi qui lui demandé de venir. D'ailleurs, elle m'a dit que c'était pas la première fois, elle avait tout essayé. Les tringles à rideaux, les queues de persil, les baleines de parapluie, sans compter tous les poisons qu'elle a pu avaler, c'est elle-même qui me l'a dit. In a lot of ways, this scene gets to the heart of what this film is about because Marie knows very clearly that that woman was going to have an abortion or going to induce a miscarriage no matter what. She had reached her wit's end. She was, we, we see her, she's, she's borderline suicidal. So she's either going to, going to miscarry or she's going to kill herself. And Marie knows this. She knows the dire straits that this woman is in. Marie also knows, and as the film tells us, or as the film conveys at least, or implies, none of the other women in her care ha have died because of her procedures. So it is possible that this woman died because of Marie's procedure, and that can happen with any invasive procedure. It is also possible, as Marie says, that the woman got impatient and did something further to herself. The film has shown us that Marie's procedure takes a few days. When she first administers it to her neighbor, her first patient, it's not for another day or two, the film doesn't say exactly, that the fetus is aborted after the procedure. So Marie knows this. And as she says, she told the woman that. But even as Marie knows that she's not necessarily in the wrong here, she's also heartbroken about the loss of this woman and her husband and the life that her children are now going to be forced to lead. And this, I think a lot of people who watch this scene, their first reaction would be, if any of you, my viewers, are, I don't know, are anti-choice, um, the reaction might be, see, abortion's bad. But that's not what the film is saying here. What the film is saying is, see, illegal abortions without medical supervision, without a sterile environment, without access for women to all of those things, that's what's bad. And that's why the woman dies, because of the illegality of abortion, not because of abortion. And it's a really important scene because it makes that claim, I argue, it makes that claim in a scene of complex moral emotion. And the film is not afraid to look at the complexity of this moral emotion and still come down on the side of Marie. I mentioned that I wasn't going to say a lot about the film's style, the cinematography, editing, production design, and so on, but it's worth mentioning a little bit because we are dealing with masters here and in the relationship between Chabrol and Rabier, uh, a director and a cinematographer who've worked together on tons of films, who seem to know each other. And there's some really lovely film work, and it's very subtle at this point. It's not showy like some of the sort of long takes in, in Le Boucher where it's, it's more kind of low key and reserved. One of the things it does really well is to use geography of place and off-screen space to tell story. For example, when Paul comes home from work one day and he's not to, meant to be home yet, we know that Marie has invited Lucien over for dinner. And Paul comes into the house and the way it's shot, this film is not a thriller like many of Chabrol's films are, but this film, this sequence has a lot of kind of thriller feel to it because we know that there's a good chance that Lucien's in the flat. And as Paul walks through the space and the camera 
follows him and repositions itself and, and different shots are kind of set up and reset up. The anticipation builds. And my, one of my favorite parts in the film, and this is really small, is when he looks at the kitchen table and we see the wine there. We, I was expecting to see <laughs> Marie and Lucien sitting there sort of like making gaga at each other drinking wine, but we see the dinner table and the wine. It hasn't been cleaned up, so we know, you know, this is the film saying, yes, this is the same night as the dinner date, but where are they? It just ratchets up the tension. This is Chabrol and Rabier using their skill as stylists you know, having made dozens of films about, uh, you know, sort of Hitchcockian thrillers in this domestic drama. And then eventually we're gonna get him turn the corner and there they are in bed together asleep. And it has the opposite effect of a thriller because we've kind of been waiting for this to happen. You're also thinking like, oh, maybe he's gonna walk in on them, you know, in flagrante, <laughs> in the act, but no, seeing them after the act, after the date, after the sex. It doesn't have that thriller payoff. It, it's more of a sort of heartbreaking moment. And it does something that the film does really well that I've alluded to throughout, which is to create empathy for Paul. We are on Marie's side, but she's cruel to him. And we see it here, especially at this point, She's got, I've, I've, I've described her as blasé. We get to this point where now she doesn't even care if her husband finds her in bed with another man. It's heartbreaking and sad. And I'll come back to that because it's very important that the film creates that empathetic bond between the audience and Paul. But first I want to talk about one of my other lovely little stylistic moments in the film. It's almost a kind of a nothing moment, but throughout the film, Marie has talked about her desire to be a singer. She keeps saying, I want to have a career as a singer. I want to be a famous singer. I want to sing on the stage. We see her singing to her children. We see her singing in the bath. We know that she loves this. And as she starts to, to get money from renting out space to Lulu and from performing abortions, she can afford a few things in life. And one of those things is, is singing lessons. And we don't know this at first. She gets into a fight with Paul and she runs off and we see her come to this building and just look at the way this is filmed. Look at the way this is staged. It's wonderful. camera. We don't know what she's going into. We see the nurse is like, is she going to perform an abortion in a hospital? That seems outrageous. What, what's going on here? And then that floating camera along the building and then up through the window, it's almost spying on her for a moment. We will cut inside and we will hear their conversation. But first it's like giving her a little bit of private space to be fully happy. This is the only actual thing she said throughout the film that she wants. And we see her getting it. And that camera shooting through the window lets her get it for a moment and be in that moment before it all comes crashing down. And it all comes crashing down because of Paul. We've seen Paul throughout the film 
doing these sort of collage cutout artworks. And he tells Marie at one point that he likes to do them because they give him a sense of control in this life where he doesn't have a lot of control. And after one particularly bad encounter with Marie, uh, he goes into his room, to his little desk, and we see him, we think, oh, he's going to do some more collage, but no, rather, he starts to cut out one of those newspaper letter letters. He's had enough. And when I said earlier that the film creates this empathetic bond with Paul, I think one of the reasons it does that is so that when we get to this moment, there's some heartbreak. Because one of the powers of the film is that we can relate to Marie and Paul throughout. You might take a side, you might feel like, oh, she's totally justified in treating him this way. But I think it would be hard to watch the whole film and think, oh, Paul's such a jerk, he deserves everything he gets. You might think she deserves her independence, she deserves her freedom, but he deserves something too. Um, you might watch the film and think, God, she's horrible to him. Why does she have to be that way? He's such a nice guy. But you're not going to hate her. I mean, some of you might hate her because of what she does, but that's on you. It's not on the film. Um, uh, and so it, it achieves this nice balancing act where we are okay with both of them and each of them are annoying sometimes, but they're, they both seem to be good people who are trying. And so that when Paul sits down to write this letter, the, the bottom drops out. And this is where, when I was watching the film, I really felt knocked off my feet because this is where all of Paul's ego, all of Paul's disappointment, his rage, his dented masculinity, his um, frustrated sex drive, all the things that we've seen build and it seems like he's been handling fairly well throughout the film, push him to the moment of destruction because he knows that abortion is illegal and he knows that if he reports his wife for it, she is going at the least to spend some time in jail. Not only does he report her for the abortions, he also reports her for letting out rooms to prostitutes. And inevitably, she's arrested. And so the final 20 minutes or so of the film see Marie progress through the sort of Vichy, occupied French uh, legal and penal system from a series of different jails where she's treated horribly by the other inmates. Most of them, one of them befriends her, but most of them treat her horribly and into meetings with different lawyers and finally in court and then in her final walk to the guillotine. There's one lawyer who feels really bad for her. He sees what's happening. He sees that she's being made an example of and he doesn't agree with this, but he understands why it's happening. As he tries to explain it to her, Marie's state becomes very clear. And, and this is part of what makes the film so effective is that for the first hour or so, 70, 80 minutes, as Marie has kind of moved up in the world is not the right way to put it. I mean, she's still in a state of precariousness even at the end of the film, but she can now like afford the jam, afford the singing lessons. She has friends. She has started to enjoy her life. And as she's done that, we have seen this confident woman, this good mother, this not great wife, but not horrible. You know, she, there's peace in their house when Paul is not trying to throw himself at her. But throughout it all, the, the film has been building in a way where we've seen her confidence and her happiness grow. And once she's put into this legal system, that goes away almost immediately. She is uneducated. She is illiterate or to a certain degree illiterate. She says at one point, you know, I can't write. She is just <sighs> completely out of her depth when it comes to understanding why this is happening to her and why it's happening to her in the way that it is. She knows that what she was doing was illegal, 
but she doesn't understand why in the midst of war, in the midst of occupation, when there are Nazi soldiers patrolling the streets of France, when the men of France are being sent to fight, to die, the young men, when there are women around her who are widows now because their husbands are dead, um, prisoners of war, injured, in the midst of all this death and destruction, what she's doing as she sees it is helping women have better lives. And she's going to be punished for that. She's going to be made an example of for that. And she just doesn't understand why. I mean, I think inherently she knows, but she doesn't understand. There's a disconnect there. And so she asks her lawyer, this sympathetic man, why am I being made an example of? And when he explains it to her, this for me, watching this over the past couple days, was the gut punch. Let's have a look. There's maybe an error. Pardon. Sorry. Thank you. It's complicated. Leur souci, c'est de faire un exemple. Un exemple de quoi Un exemple de quoi Si vous voulez, au départ, ce tribunal a été constitué pour juger des crimes contre l'État. Mais comment vous dire L'État, vu l'époque où nous vivons, la défaite, l'occupation, tout ça, est devenu très pointilleux sur les questions de morale. En somme, tout ce qui porte atteinte à la morale est considéré comme portant atteinte à l'État. Ils prétendent qu'il y a plus d'avortements que de naissances. Ça les effraie pour les... So you get a situation here <laughs> in a film that was made 35 years ago, set in a world 80 years ago, and what he's saying in that scene sounds like an echo of what the people who oppose abortion in the United States say today in 2022. The state is getting involved in decisions of morality, personal decisions of morality. They see it as against the state. And without getting into too much of a deep dive into the sort of the darker politics behind this, when he says, oh, there's a rumor going around that there are more abortions than births, you don't have to look that far in America to hear people saying, you know, white people, the backbone of the state are being replaced and abortion is to blame. And it's really about controlling women and controlling their bodies and controlling their purpose in life. And that's what the film examines here. And as Marie goes through this system, what she learns and what we learn is that in the world of occupied France, there is no way she can win. And the gut punch for me, I said at the top of this video that, you know, it really knocked me off my feet is thinking that world might just be around the corner again, you know? And that is devastating. I live in a country now, Ireland, where just a few years ago, the population voted to make abortion illegal, to give women this right. And this is a country that was kind of controlled, dominated, in some senses ravaged by the Roman Catholic Church for decades or centuries even. And the people stood up and threw off that yoke of control and embraced this positive change. And to live here in my adopted home and to see this positivity and that it was, it wasn't even close, you know, this was not a close referendum. And so to see a world in which that can happen and yet in the bastion of liberty that is the United States, to see it stepping backwards is, is devastating. Um, so... Obviously, the film is not about that. It was made 35 years ago. But it is about that. It's about worlds in which that can happen. And in that sense, even as I watched this great film, I also felt this 
kind of sense of despair about where the world is at today. <laughs> and as Marie goes to her death at the end, it just compounded that sense of despair. So if you're in the mood for something like that, this is a fantastic film. The performances are great, the writing's great, the direction's great. It's just so wonderfully and carefully made. And the thing about it is, some of you watching, I mean, I think anyone who's watching my channel at this point after a year and a half of doing these videos knows where I stand or at least where I lean politically. Um, but if you're watching this and you happen to be a person who is um, anti-choice, um, a forced birther, <laughs> that's what you are, um, you might still find something in this film because what it does, I think, is it approaches the topic with honesty. Now, you might not agree with the conclusion that the film comes to, but the film is not didactic and the film is not, um, it's not preaching. It's telling a tale with open eyes. And that's why I think it's important that Marie is a flawed person and a flawed character. When you get films like this, um, Amelda Staunton is one, which is a great film in a lot of ways, but she's such a saint in that film and she's so good that it's hard to think of her as a person almost. Whereas here, Marie is very much flawed. She can be cruel, she can be short-sighted, she can be frivolous. But in depicting her that way, I think it lets what she does and her decisions around abortion stand for what they are. They don't necessarily have to be attached to the sainted angel. And that's part of the power of the film and that's what I mean by it. it's honesty. Um, some of you might disagree and I would love to hear your thoughts below if we can keep it somewhat civil, we'll see. That's hard on this topic. Anyhow, thanks for watching everybody. If you're still here at this point, you must really like this channel and my video. So please like the video. Um, hit the subscribe button, share this with your friends, and don't forget to vote in the poll for what's coming next. As I've said, this is the final film in the French Spring Film series. So next up will either be Mumblecore, some films of John Sayles, which also can touch on abortion, uh, or punk rock movies, whatever that means. So I'll leave that poll open till, let's say till next Wednesday. So make sure you go and vote and that'll be up next. I've also got another series coming. Keep your eye out for that. And whatever you think about this topic, whatever you think about this film, and whatever you think about me for talking about abortion so positively in this discussion, whatever you do, keep watching movies.